Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Planning Control Committee of the 19th of July 2018. Um, I believe there's quite a few people stuck in traffic because of an event at the cricket ground, so what I suggest we do is the, um, start the agenda and, and uh, m maybe have a break uh, before we make any decisions that, if that's still a problem. But um, I have an apology from Councillor West and Councillor McChrystal. Are there any others? Shiraz Khan. Any others? No. Thank you. Um, there are no late items to be introduced by me other than to thank all the people involved yesterday in the um, site visit to Middleton House that also took in a presentation on regeneration, Duckworth Square and um, uh, various other places which were, was quite informative and, and useful um, and thank you for, for coming to that. Any declarations of interest, anybody? Take that as a no. Uh, the minutes of the meeting held on the 31st of May 2018. Everybody happy that there are a true record of what then and then took place? Thank you. And the minutes of the meeting held of the Conservation Area Advisory Committee on both the 19th of April and the 14th of June. Noted, uh, noted thank you. Um, which brings us to the um, items to be considered. Item six. Is it your wish? I think we've got a few more people here. We certainly quarrel that we, we start to proceed. Um, does anybody know of anybody on the way? Okay. Um, well, perhaps the answer then is, is not to deal with that one first, but to move to Agard Street. Um, here's Peter Steer. Forget what I just said. Welcome, Mr. Steer. We, we were just waiting for you. <laughs> the traffic's awful, we know. Right then, Cussington House Park Farm Centre, Park Farm Drive, Alice Street. And uh, Mr. Claxton's going to introduce that to us. Oops. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is a full application for extensions and alterations to Cassington House which is on the roof of Park Farm Shopping Centre in Alastry to form a student accommodation. The scheme would involve some alterations to the rooftop car park above the centre to form a new access and servicing core for the accommodation um, and the car park and new entrance lobby for the accommodation at ground floor level of the centre. I've got a few updates for members which have been circulated. We've had nine additional objections from local residents since the report was printed in response to the reconsultation for the amended plans uh, these include further comments from Councillor Webb. Uh, we've got further comments from the police liaison officer which have been received, which are particularly in relation to the student management plan submitted with the amendments. Uh, he recommends conditions for the details of security measures, management regime and cycle parking. Um, and the recommended conditions in section eight of your report, about five, conditions five and eight, uh, will be updated to reflect the police officer's comments. Uh, Land Drainage Team have also responded, raising no further comments. Um, I just need to highlight for members uh, an omission of a word severe in paragraph 2, page 11 in Highways and Parking, which is the MPPF uh, statement about severe impact on the highway network. Apologies for that. In terms of the main body of the report, the proposal is to replace 22 existing one-bed flats with 72 flats uh, to provide student accommodation comprising 64 one-bed studio flats, four six-bed and four ten-bed cluster flats with communal kitchen and workspace. Total of 128 bedrooms are proposed within the building. Number of units and bedrooms has been reduced slightly following submission of the amended plans. Uh, the original submission was 132 bed spaces. In terms of the design and scale, the proposed extensions to Carsington House would include a four-storey side extension to the end elevation fronting Park Farm Drive, an additional floor over the whole of the block. The building would also be reclad in render panels and a metal mesh framework over parts of the elevations, 
New window openings and glazed panels are also to be introduced into the building. The extensions would increase the scale and proportions of the building substantially, though in the context of other apartment buildings within and around Park Farm Centre and its location within the centre, uh, the additions are considered to be acceptable and in keeping with the general character of Park Farm Centre and the wider residential area. In terms of highways and parking, the building sits above the rooftop car park for the Park Farm Shopping Centre, which currently has 87 parking spaces for shoppers and 22 permitted spaces for the existing residents of the flats. The extensions of the, to the building would result in a loss of up to 19 of the current spaces and would provide one disabled bay and one drop-off parking bay for the student accommodation. There were no parking spaces given to the residents of the student accommodation, but 52 secure cycle spaces would be provided with a further 10 open cycle spaces on the rest of the car park. The car-free nature of the development is one of the primary concerns which has been raised by objectors, and the applicant has sought to address this by submitting revised transport assessment and travel plan in order to demonstrate how the accommodation would operate, particularly at the beginning and end of term time for drop-off and pick-up. This is alluded to in page 12 of your report. In terms of parking in general, it is considered that the likely absence of residence parking would discourage cars being brought to the site, particularly since there are parking restrictions and time-limited parking in and around the Park Farm Centre. There are also other examples of similar types of student accommodation which have been developed or are being developed elsewhere in the city, which also operate with no car parking on site. The management regime adopted by the operators, which is referred to in the student management plan, should also discourage residents from bringing cars to the site, and this is hopefully secured by Condition 9 of your report. The highways team's position is that given the existing parking restrictions, the accessibility of the development to public transport and cycle routes, and amenities in close proximity at Park Farm Centre, the proposed development will have a minimal impact on the local highway network particularly since the existing 22 flats which have permitted parking spaces would be removed. The highways officer overall has no objections to the proposal in relation to the highway impacts on the local area and my colleague Paul Chamberlain can give any further comments on this if required. In terms of impacts on residential amenity, the development would mainly affect properties on Carsington Crescent frontage to the southwest of the site and Norbury Court to the southeast of the building. Minimum distances between windows of nearby dwellings are exceeded for this development, such that we consider there would not be an unreasonable loss of privacy or massing as a result. In relation to loss of daylight and sunlight to nearby properties, a study using BRE standards has been submitted in support of the application, which assesses the impact uh, on daylight and um, sunlight to those properties. The report concludes that the development would have a low impact on light to neighbouring properties and that it meets the BRE standards. We are therefore satisfied that the extensions and alterations to the building would have a limited impact on residential amenity. In terms of the living environment provided within the student accommodation, the housing standards colleagues have advised that it meets the minimum amenity guidance and the provision of study and common rooms in addition to normal living space is considered to be a benefit. Overall, the principle of a more intensive and larger scale residential form of use on this site is considered acceptable in this sustainable location. Park Farm is sustainable and accessible with a wide range of local facilities and amenities close to the site. The accommodation building is accessible to both the main university campus at Kettleston Road and the city centre. It will also deliver additional new housing on a brownfield site contributing to the city's five-year housing supply. The proposal is subject to a section 106 agreement with agreed heads of terms set out on page 18 and is considered to meet all the policy tests in both the adopted and saved local plans and the overarching NPPF. You have three speakers. Um, the first speaker is for the applicant, <coughs> Mr Arben of DPDS Limited, if you'd like to come forward. And like all the public speakers, you have three minutes. Thank you. Good evening, Chair and members of the committee, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I firstly welcome the recommendation of the officer's report to approve this application subject to conditions. 
The report is comprehensive and I consider it, it sets out the key planning issues and that the proposals comply with the Council's planning policies. As set out in the officer's report, the site is located within an established district centre close to the existing local services and facilities and within an easy walking distance of the University's main Kedliston Road campus. It is therefore considered a highly sustainable location for a residential use of the type proposed. The proposal meets the criteria of policy CP22 of the local plan, which seeks to support the continued growth of further education establishments. In particular, it meets criteria D of that policy, which supports and encourages the development of new student accommodation, where it could lead to the release of existing accommodation for family or market housing elsewhere in the city. This is acknowledged as an important benefit within the officer's report. A significant number of object objectives have raised the issue of the development being car free. As I've already stated and as set out in the officer's report, the site is in a highly sustainable location with access to a variety of services and facilities. It is in close proximity to the university and is served by a frequent bus service to the city centre. Both the council's policies and that within the MPPF seek to encourage development in such locations to reduce the use of private car. However, due to the car-free nature of the proposal, the occupants will be discouraged from having a car on site, and this will be managed through the residential travel plan and condition nine is proposed in the officer's report. As the report before you states, there are already parking restrictions on the highways within the area and at Park Farm Centre. Therefore, the opportunity for on-street parking is limited. It should be noted that the council's own highways officer raises no objection to the proposal. Other objections are have been raised with regard to the overall height, scale and massing of the proposed alterations and extensions. Negotiations with officers have resulted in a number of revisions to the proposals that originally submitted. These have included changes to the materials palette which provides a more con contemporary appearance and enhanced presence in the street scene. Revisions have also been made to the extent of the proposed mesh cladding which has been reduced to lighten the overall bulk and massing of the proposals and break up the overall scale. I agree with the officer's conclusions that at present casting houses have limited architectural merit and the proposal would have a positive impact on its overall appearance and contribution to the street scene. With regards to residential amenity, Carsington houses some 28 to 30 metres from the closest dwellings on Carsington Crescent. Whilst an additional floor is being proposed as part of the development, this separation distance will remain and it is acknowledged within the officer's report that the window relationships with nearby houses will not be substantially greater than that which is currently exists. In conclusion, I agree with the findings of your case, officer. The proposed development is consistent with planning policies. It has been demonstrated that taking into account all material planning considerations, this application is sustainable, and as such, national and local planning policy is clear that development should be approved. Thank you, Mr. Arvin. Uh, can I ask Mr. Steer to come forward? Uh, yeah, could I just clarify some things with Mr. Arvin, please? If it will help us come to a decision, uh, yes, if it can be brief. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Arben, uh, could I just ask that the developers have been very keen to point out that the accommodation block is in walking distance to the university campus on nearby Kettleston Road. However, the university has a large number of such campuses throughout, the, throughout Derbyshire. There is no guarantee that these students housed in this accommodation will not have to travel large distances throughout Derbyshire to attend lectures. Isn't that true? Can you guarantee that all these students living at this accommodation will be attending the main Kedliston Road campus? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Steer, you have three minutes, like everybody else. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> the single-storey extension on top of the existing Carsington House and the four-storey extension to be built over the co-op store will be constructed from factory-produced boxes. The single word modular is used twice in the application documents to describe these boxes, <coughs> and the committee report makes no mention of this at all. Can you approve an application for a building without any information whatsoever on the proposed construction materials, how they are put together, and whether they have the required lifespan? The four-storey extension will be of lightweight construction over a car parking area. The consequent risks to the safety of the occupants from fire and explosion are not considered. So what about the Park Farm variegated cherry? 
The existing Carsington house and its single story extension are to be pale red render, with the four story extension to be slightly different in light red exterior panels. The committee report gets it wrong, describing the wall finish throughout as rendered panels with a red tone finish. There is no explanation for the change from the, the original off-white finish. The parking area over the co-op is for permit holders only. The public parking is only at the lower roof level, reducing the number to 44 spaces, not 89, thus compounding the identified park farm parking problem. Recent amendments to the plan layouts in the old Carsington House result in zigzagging passageways to the escape stair that would be condemned by any fire safety novice. Access to nearly half the accommodation is via lifts and then stairways, not good for disabled access, not considered in the report. Are fire mains and sprinklers to be provided? Is there need for fire service access to dry risers and for water storage for sprinklers? Again, not mentioned in any of the documents before you. <coughs> the mess cladding is a potential environmental liability from wind noise. Wind noise can arise from vortex shedding at the end of a run of mesh. Wind noise from mesh cladding, such as at Torbay Hospital and many buildings around the world, creates problems for both building occupants and the neighboring properties. The long runs of balustrading on the long elevations can sing quite merrily, reference Gray Lynn in Auckland. Tonal wind noise from mesh cladding and balustrades is not considered anywhere in the application. This application cannot, in its present form, be considered acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Steer. Uh, Councillor Webb, would like to come forward. Good evening, Chair. Fellow councillors, on the one hand, we have an application for 128 units of student accommodation, creating 22 houses on the open market, a student management plan, a car-free development, and a statement of community involvement. On the other hand, we have 22 existing tenants who will need housing when they are evicted. Net housing gain, zero. A mixed elderly and sheltered accommodation community wondering why in a student management plan there is so much security for student accommodation. Is there good reason for this? A car-free development where, and I quote, any additional highway parking which subsequently takes place as a result of the proposals is likely to be dispersed throughout the area and would not likely to have a detrimental effect on the highway network. The proposal is independent from the University of Derby. However, the planning application is unable to prohibit car ownership. The impact on the community is well documented. Parking, size and scale of development, overlooking and massing, impacting on ex existing community, both in residential and commercial terms. There has been no direct engagement with affected tenants. The residential tenants and their letting agents are still awaiting any engagement as this will affect their lives and future, as are the commercial tenants, particularly the Dolly Tub laundrette, whose premises will be lost as they are to be converted into an access and lift shaft. This will be detrimental to both students, if approved, and the local uh, community. Consultation is supposed to be a two-way thing. 
Can I suggest to committee this application fails on amenity and harm, GD5, making a positive contribution to the community, CP4, no net gaining housing provision, CP6, providing a high quality living environment, H13, why should students live in accommodation that would not suit any normal residential use and high quality architecture and integrated well into its setting, Thank CP3. You, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Claxton, would you like to come? Yeah, thank you, Chair. There's, there's a few things to, to respond to. Um, just taking it in order, in terms of the construction, um, they, the applicant does refer to modular construction, which is basically things build, being built off-site and then brought to site. That isn't actually something we can control under the planning system. Um, it's controlled by building regulations. In terms of fire safety, again, that is covered under building regulations. Um, I know there was reference to sprinklers. Um, this isn't something we can impose by condition, but if you wish, we could put an informative note um, to the applicant to, to consider that as part of the development. Um, in terms of disabled access, um, the, the Billy building is, would be fully lift access for both the car park and the student accommodation. So in terms of the new provider disabled bay on the car park, so we're satisfied that it meets the tests have been accessible. Um, in terms of uh, residents to be affected, it is a privately owned uh, landlord. Um, we have no control over um, how they deal with their tenants. So in terms of the plan, that isn't uh, an issue we can consider. And the security management system is something, and I presume it's something is, we do often see with flat accommodation, uh, whether it's students or, or otherwise. Um, and in a location where it is on top of a shopping centre, um, it is something we would normally require whether or not it's students or not. So that's not just because it's the nature of the, the social group. It's just to ensure that there is a safe and secure environment provided for the residents. And in terms of public consultation, um, we, we are aware that the applicant did do some pre-application consultation within Park Farm Centre. That obviously is down to them how they engage or otherwise with local businesses in the community. Um, so, so we don't have any control over that. But obviously we did do the normal uh, consultation um, and notification that we would normally do uh, as required under the Planning Act. Councillor Hassel. Thank you, Chair. Um, anyone who knows Alice Street or is indeed a councillor who has a ward that has to deal with the effects of university parking will know uh, what a blight it is for residents and the, the local area. To say that this is a car-free um, development is, is or will be is, is a bit of a fallacy, really. I don't see how that will be policed. Um, there's been mention of that there is um, restricted parking in the local streets, but not beyond. So clearly, this just pushes the problem into those streets just beyond the restricted areas and causes even further issues. Within this report, um, it's mentioned that the extensions to Carsington House are substantial in scale. And clearly, uh, from what is currently a 22-bedroom um, flats development going to 128 bedrooms, will obviously bring a very large increase in, in, in numbers to the area. We should be mindful that this will put a strain on local services and infrastructure, like uh, doctors and dentists. And we should also be mindful that uh, student accommodation is not subject to council tax, which in itself will uh, add further pressure to the council and its services. Um, there doesn't appear to be any confirmation that these proposals are fulfilling a need. Um, I don't believe that the university has been uh, consulted in this. Um, this committee has passed many student accommodation type plans in the recent past. Um, and clearly one that was most recently converted to a refugee type centre was property of the university previously. Um, which clearly they didn't feel the need they, they, they needed at the time. 
for me, this is clearly uh, an investment uh, opportunity for properties to be converted in the future when the realisation that the uptake of um, students is, is low and will merely be converted back into uh, residential at some point in the future. For me, the biggest issue on top of parking for this is that we're talking about the displacement of residents. I realise within the report that displacement cannot be considered as a factor because they, it doesn't provide any specialist type of accommodation. But this is, these are people's homes that they've had for many years and purely turfing them out because someone wants to make money, in my view, is fundamentally morally wrong. I think overall this, this is an ill-thought-through proposal. I would object on the grounds of displacement. I do think there's, there's, there's scope there for that. I do have one question that I would like answered. Um, it states within the report that the development broadly complies with MPPF and DCLP highway policies. It states broadly, but in what way does it not completely comply with these policies? Um, thank you, Chair. Perhaps you could address that from the highway point of view. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I suspect the word broadly shouldn't be in there, should it? That's, I think that's just a, someone's used the word broadly. Well, what it, what, uh, what, MP, what MPPF says is that there's a presumption in favour of sustainable development. That's, that's what it says. And, and our own policy um, in terms of residential development, there is no standards for residential development. And what, and what our policy says, in all cases, the individual circumstances of each proposal will be taken into account, and this is the important bit, including the realistic requirements of the users. So, you know, these are students in fairly small accommodation the accessibility of the area by different transport modes and the possible impact on parking on the transport network, and that's what you're interested in. Um, in terms of impact on the network, now, this development isn't... We're not starting from a, from a, 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 blank, um, a blank sheet here where nothing's uh, nothing can be attracted to here. So we've got 22 apartments which currently exist and they're going, so there's visitors to those. There's an A1 unit, so a retail unit, which is going. There could be visitors to that. And there's also 603 square metres of office, which could be used. So you could have all of those visitors to that. So that, that could happen now without any consent. Um, so I think what my colleague was, was saying there, it's a reasonably short walk to the uh, university. Um, there is good public transport. And consequently, it's a sustainable development. And taken into account our policy, I think it meets it. The word broadly shouldn't have been there. Thank you. Um, Councillor Rawson next, but just before you speak, um, Mr Teasdale is going to give us some legal advice. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I just wanted, Chair, to actually pick up on one point that Sarah didn't actually cover in terms of uh, comments from, from the speakers. Um, I know Ms. Mr Steer actually mentioned about um, the problem of uh, noise. Um, created by, um, he suggested, the, the construction, sort of the panelling. Um, I mean, I, I don't know whether there's any evidence being produced of that, but I, I'll just point out that there are statutory controls in terms of um, public nuisance um, controls in other regimes that would, would actually deal with that problem if it is a problem. So, um, But again, I don't think there's particularly apart from what Mr. Steele has actually said this afternoon or this evening that there has been an uh, issue raised uh, by any, any sort of other expert on the matter. Do, while I'm actually speaking, I, I just want to also sort of just come back on, on what Councillor Hassel was saying in terms of a couple of points. Um, I mean, as, 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 as the Councillor recognised, um, uh, I mean, I think, I think there will be many in the chamber that um, um, would probably agree that sort of displacing uh, residents, existing residences, is, um, 
uh, he, he called it morally un unacceptable. Uh, but I, certainly, I, I suspect there'll be many in the chamber that sort of um, uh, may feel uncomfortable on, on that. Having said that, as, he, as, as Councillor Hassel has already recognised himself, it is not really a, a material planning issue to, to take into account tonight. Um, I think just a couple of other, other points. The, in terms of car-free um, side of things, in terms of enforcement, there will be a condition on that. Again, one can't guarantee how, how effective enforcement is on conditions, but, um, but it, 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 with any condition, it's largely reliant on a problem arising. And if a problem does arise, there is a condition there that hopefully will, will resolve the issue. Um, I think, yeah, I think that's all. Oh, thank you, Chair. Councillor Rawson. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think, um, in, in principle, I don't have uh, an objection to this, this application. Um, what we're talking about is an extension to an existing building uh, and with the potential to improve the visual appearance of the existing 1960s building, uh, which uh, I don't think anyone would say is an architectural gem of any, any description. Um, we're talking about going from three to four storeys um, with the addition of a southern facing wing as well um, uh, to, um, to be added to the existing building. Um, included as well we've got the conversion of empty office space um, which would uh, bring that back into, into good use. Um, I think it's got many positive environmental features. Um, car-free development, um, cycling spaces, um, cycle parking spaces and photovoltaic uh, solar panels. Um, it is within easy access to the university um, and there are good transport links. So from I think that, from that point of view from, for the students it would, um, it, it would be very convenient and um, easy to access. Um, we do have um, 41, I think, um, objections. Um, um, so um, we do obviously ha uh, have to look at those, take those into consideration. Um, and I think officers in the report have addressed quite a number of those um, in terms of highways, um, highways say, um, the number of trips that it would generate wouldn't have uh, a material impact on the surrounding road network um, flood risk um, there's no issues there um, where I do have a couple of questions and I'd, I'd agree with what's already been said this issue of displacement is um, uncomfortable I think um, for, for for many of us um, uh, and um, I wonder if um, uh, Mr Teasdale could perhaps uh, at the risk of repeating himself again, just clarify if there are any grounds around displacement that committee could consider, um, 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 you know, to um, uh, to go against this application. My other question really is around um, fire safety. Uh, 5.6 and um, we're talking about cladding. We all know the issues nationally there, so just some reassurance. Um, um, from that point of view, um, although I, I think that's probably covered by building regulations, but if, if we could probably just have an answer on that. And are we able to insist on sprinklers in the building as a condition? Um, somebody new to planning committee, um, it's, uh, I'm sure it's been discussed before, and uh, the uh, I'm sure will be governed by national legislation as to uh, um, the, whether whether we could insist on that or not. Um, but if we could, I would certainly um, I would certainly suggest that we um, we do look at sprinklers as part of the development. Um, but um, I think overall, chair, in terms of the um, uh, in in terms of providing the extra housing provision. Um, the massing, the daylight, the effect on neighbouring properties has been addressed uh, as part of the report. Um, so, subject, I think, to the answers to those questions, I think I would support this, Chair.
Mr. Teasdale then on uh, displacement, and then Mrs. Claxton on um, uh, sprinklers and cladding. Uh, thank you, Chair. I was going to suggest that myself. Yeah, in, in, in terms of displacement, I mean, uh, as the officer said um, when she presented the report, there, there are not any um, vulnerable uh, uh, groups or uh, equal, so equality issues don't come into play in, in terms of that. That displacement might have have a uh, relevance if that was the case, but my understanding that is not the case. So the displacement, however uncomfortable sort of members may may feel about that, it's really not a matter that you could materially be taken into account to, tonight. Um, I mean. Again, we are in a commercial world. I mean, sort of, uh, and if, if a landowner wishes to develop their land, then um, that is their choice rather than a, a matter for you to be able to um, put into consideration tonight. Yeah, in terms of the cladding, I think we've, we have been through this before in other developments under the Caesar. A recognised concern about cladding. Um, it is covered under building regulations, so you know we only look at the appearance and design, but we're not able to look at what it's actually constructed of and whether it complies with fire safety regulations. That is beyond our remit. Uh, in terms of sprinklers, as I said, we're not able to condition it, um, but we can attach an informative note uh, so the applicant that members would. Uh, like to see it included within within the building. I just would like to point out in terms of need for, for student accommodation, there is no test uh, of that we can apply for need um, to be able to consider whether the student accommodation should or should not be um, provided in this location. Uh, I, I'd certainly appreciate having a note put about um, sprinklers in, and I hope that they would listen to it. But I, I think it's going to be quite difficult to gain access to that um, upper levels of that building from a, even one of the long um, fire, what do we call them, high, high level, whatever. Uh, the, um, I think this mesh sounds really strange. I don't know if, I, I presume that planning officers have seen examples of it. I'm not sure what it'll really look like. Um, but if you've got any more comments about the visual impact of, of the mesh and why that sort of thing would be chosen, um, I think that would be helpful to me at least. Uh, in terms of the trans... Yeah, but it just looks weird. It just looks like a scaffold. It looks as if it's, looks as if it's half built and it's permanently half built. But what's, what's its function supposed to be? What's its purpose? Why is it... Why is it being done like that? Is it to provide shading from the sun um, and therefore does it have a function in, in temperature control? You know, if, if you know why it's there, is it, has it got structural elements underneath it which help provide support for the, f new, the new floor? Floor, you know, I just wondered if, if we have any answers to those sorts of questions. It might make it a bit more, might add some um, comprehension to its choice. Uh, there might be some very good reasons for it. The, my um, transport, though, is, is for me one of the biggest issues. I think that the building, the existing building, is fairly ugly when I've been there, and I think it probably is in need of major refurbishment, which this would provide an opportunity for. Uh, it is a bit bulkier, but it is some distance from other houses, and it's from the point of view from where we're looking from, this is, this is the north view of the building, so it's not going to have a major overshadowing effect on the existing properties which are in this direction, which are a considerable distance away. It will have more of an effect on the, cent the park farm centre itself um, and provide shading to that and to the, the properties, some of which I think are bungalows, to the, the west. Um, but it, it is some distance away. But the transport is, I think, a bit more of an issue. If, I, if there isn't sensible signing, somebody visiting here wouldn't know that there was, spare, there was cycle parking available on site. So cycle parking signing, so that when you're visiting somebody there, you know to take your bicycle up and not park it in Park Farm, would be helpful, or on the street. Um, and that's a minor point, but I'm sure it can be looked at. Um, 
But I'm concerned about how cyclists gain access to the cycle parking. I haven't seen any plans about whether they share the, the car entrance ramp, whether there are going to be safety issues there for the 52 cyclists and the 10 visiting cyclists <laughs> conflicting with the cars. And if that's not been explored, then I'd like to have some knowledge about that in terms of conflict and safety. These are going to be residents in a residence-only parking area. Are they going to have access to visitors' permits so that their visitors who come by car would be able to gain access, be able to park on the nearby streets? And if not, if people are choosing to park here and they are not being permitted to park in the um, retail parking areas, I think there might then be pressure to extend the residence parking area because it's not that far from here. It's, I think it's just the other side of the church that the residence only parking ends. Um, in which case, I think that is something that we should at least get advice on. Um, the, my other point was oh, and to do with the, the PVs, and I very much welcome having PVs built onto the building, but it's very easy to just forget to put them in. So I think they ought to be conditioned. We should expect them to be installed and operational before anybody goes into the flats to live. Thank you. Councillor Potter. Thank you, Chair. Just to comment on the mesh, I think it just adds to the absolute intolerable visual impact of the site. It takes me back to my days in uh, service in Northern Ireland, actually. It's just a military blockhouse. Stick a couple of armoured Land Rovers outside and I'd feel right at home. Um, now, the adverse effect on, this on the residential amenities of neighbours by reason of Noise, disturbance, overlooking, loss of privacy, overshadowing, loss of a long-standing much-used laundrette and other amenities, especially during construction, etc. The unacceptable high density and overdevelopment of the site. It will be an attraction to crime and criminals. We, Alastry councillors, already are greatly affected by travelling criminals coming into Alastry. We have gangs of youths wandering about at two and three o'clock in the morning with sledgehammers trying to break into shops. This will just attract more people. Um, one thing I do want to make clear is we are still saying, and I've heard an officer say it again, that students will have a relatively short walk to the campus on Kedleston Road site. Yet the developer's representative says he cannot guarantee that the students here will go to Kedleston Road site. They could travel anywhere in Derbyshire. And to travel anywhere in Derbyshire, they're going to have cars. We, Alastry councillors, already know the problems of car parking in Alastry. Yes, there are restrictions, but they're very rarely enforceable. The police can't enforce it. The council struggle to enforce it. It will have to be that Alastry becomes a totally no car parking zone apart from residents and visitors. Carsington Crescent already has 76 per hour, 76 vehicles travelling against the restrictions placed thereon. The police tell us they are powerless and they point the finger at the council. It's your problem, you sort it out. We can only put a sticking plaster on a wound. So what do we do when all these students come? What sanctions will be placed on students who bring cars? Will they be told to go from the site? Will they be expelled from the site? Who knows? Um, We've already mentioned, or we've already heard from Mr. Steer about the design, including bulk and massing, detailing and materials. I believe, and I agree with him, it's totally out of character for the existing original traditionally built structures, which will allow a far more open plan estate to be enjoyed by both residents and shoppers alike. Let's look at those pedal cycles. Yes, there are spaces for 70 pedal cycles. But we, Alastry councillors, already know of the problems that pedal cycles cause in Park Farm. It's inundated with cyclists. It used to have restrictions that you couldn't ride a cycle through Park Farm. 
Thank you, Frank. But now these restrictions after refurbishment have not been replaced. So bikes are regularly dropped by their riders outside chip shops, outside the news agents, outside all popular shops, causing trip hazards for residents. They are absolutely terrified. And now we're going to possibly add 70 more. Park Farm is an area which and where car drivers, pedestrians and pedal cyclists come together. We've had, already had in the last 12 months three serious road traffic collisions around Park Farm, one of them being a fatal. We can't, we just cannot have any more impact at Park Farm. Um, we've already mentioned that student accommodation does not require payment of council tax and I don't want to say anything about students because they've got a right to live somewhere. But Derby City has a relatively limited ability to raise resources through council tax due to the high proportion, 51% of band aid properties. So now here we are looking at putting another 150 people who are going to want doctors, they're going to want dentists, they're possibly going to want mental health support as uh, a lot of students actually suffer from these problems. Have all these answers, have all these questions been answered? No, they haven't. This will have an absolute drastic effect on residents who do actually pay their council tax and pay it on time. Therefore, I will not be able to support this proposal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Kerr actually raised a question about netting. Can anybody answer that one? Thank you. Yeah, just referring to the yeah, just referring to the design access statement um, in terms of materials, and it basically says, I think it is, it's a design feature, basically, and it says chosen materials have been selected to deliver a design that feels and looks transparent. So I think the intention is that it just gives a bit of transparency to, to the building. And in terms of cycle parking, we, any, we, can, we can sort of add it to the condition, if you wish, and access for cyclists. Is, there is lift access proposed both to the student accommodation and the parking level. Um, so, you know, hopefully that, that should address some of that issue. Thank you. Um, Councillor Kerr, do you want to come back on that? I'm sorry, I just, the idea of adding an extra structure for transparency. It just makes it bigger. It's, it's, it, has no, it doesn't have a function. Because it, it's a bit like a climbing frame and it seems to me a bit of an invitation for um, fit young people, who mostly students are, to climb. And is it, has it been experienced elsewhere as a safety hazard for people with more time and energy than sense? Um, the, the other, my other concern, and the comment about um, distance from the university, the university has now got these e-bikes, and this is obviously going to be, I can imagine, sort of, you've got a nine o'clock lecture, and oh dear me, it's, it's, it's quarter to nine, and my alarm's just gone off, and I better be there very quickly. So to have e-bikes parked here to get you to the university is going to be quite useful. So oh, is that something that we can condition that they ought to help fund some e-bikes to go from here to university? Which would then obviously also be available for any other Alistair residents to use. We can't even condition that it'll be students that live there, can we? Let alone bikes, but... But, but they'd be available for anybody. Yeah, okay. But they're um, useful for that area and... I'd like to comment on that No. I'm sorry, I can't help you. My understanding is the e-bikes are provided by a company. One assumes that if there's a demand, then the company will provide e-bikes in the fullness of time. Okay. Uh, Councillor Harwood and then Councillor Evans. Well, thank you, Chair. Well, I think the nitty-gritty of this at uh, Hallistry, if this has passed, is going to suffer again. Uh, over the years, the problems they've had with parking, particularly with students from the university, uh, has been an absolute disaster for Alistair. And these are the people that pay the ICE council tax 
uh, in the city. And here we go again with a proposal that states that uh, students would not have cars. Well, you can't tell anybody not to have a car. Most people grow up and when they get to the age of having a car, they have a car. You don't care what anybody says and students are certainly no different and if you go to the university or branches of the university you'll find lots of cars put all over the place. I mean take the campus at Mark Eaton Street. Problems galore with parking of cars in that area. Mostly students who are using the facility there at uh, Mark Eaton. No, it, it, Mr. Arvin himself has admitted he can't control where these students will be going. And somebody says, it's a good bus service. Well, that, I'm sorry, that is not true. Bus services from Alistair go to the city centre. They don't go via uh, university campuses. And students want to get there, and they will use cars. Mm -hmm. So that is completely and utterly a farcical shambles to say that they will not have cars. So where are they going to park? Well, other street has got its problems, it's always had its problems, and quite honestly, this has only add to them. I don't feel at all that this is in the right place. Uh, I'm against the height of the building, but then again, uh, it will stand out like a sore thumb. Quite honestly, uh, this is a development that's not needed for that area, and the fact that it appears that the university haven't been consulted uh, on this, or have put something in on this, to me, speaks that it's purely a development to make money. Also, no, in this report, is there anything about the 22 residents that occupy that property at the moment. I feel for those people. A lot of them are senior people. To disturb them at their time of life, with nothing to guide them where they can go and live, to me is absolutely unacceptable. And quite honestly, uh, I won't be voting for this because I just don't feel in my own mind that it's the right place the right thing to do and really quite honestly hasn't got the capabilities of carrying out what the developers have said. Okay. Councillor Evans. Thank you Chair. Uh, really when I first looked at this, uh, the artist impression, I too thought it was uh, a building under construction with scaffold up. Uh, I, I did say to Lucy earlier, it, it looks like a birdcage. Uh, would I want to live near that? Would anybody want to live near that? And that's the litmus test, really. And the answer's got to be no. Uh, for me, and it, it needs re refurbishing. The building needs refurbishing and updating. Nobody would dispute that. But what's proposed here is far exceeds that. Uh, it, I'd liken it, really, to a 1960s USSR Eastern Bloc building. Is that where we want to be for our quality of life for the future? Not, I don't think so. I'll certainly be voting against it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you, you'll be able to see this building because it's there. Uh, trying to put net all over it doesn't make it transparent. It's an admission that it's ugly in the first place, is it not? You'll see this coming from Kettleston Hall. You'll see it coming uh, miles away. It's, it's on the top of a hill. That particular shopping centre has struggled over the years and it's a little out of date, fair enough. One of the problems is that you don't get much sun in there uh, and you get quite a bit of wind, so it's, it's not ideal. The great thing about it is that people from all over the city can go and use it and park free with no hassle uh, for the time that they're shopping. There's a Boots there, there's charity shops, there's, there's a Wix's, all of which, if you go into town or go to Allenton or the other ones, you know, parking is a real problem. Here, you can actually park for a short time and it, it, it's useful. So that shopping center is viable. By putting a great big building beside it, you're gonna cut out what sunlight there is, and I would have thought, increase the wind, because you're, you're, you're canyoning, as the uh, expression seems to be. So I, I, I feel those, those things go together. So it's, it's, it's the visual appearance and, and where it is. If I lived in Carsington Crescent, 
And I'd suffered all that I have done for the university. The university is a jolly good thing, but you know, those people have suffered for many years, 20, 25 years now uh, for, from parking. And to have this plonked right on top of your, you know, every time you go out of the house, you see that, I think would be disastrous for them. Council tax is irrelevant to planning. I'm sorry, fair point, but as is, is um, you know, the, uh, our moral feelings about the, um, the people who will be kicked out of their houses. Um, Councillor Potter did raise points about mental health and so on. Um, that is actually covered on page 18 um, as one of the requirements of a section 106 agreement. So um, our officers have kindly thought of that. Does anybody else wish to speak from the committee? Yes. Councillor Kerr. I don't think it'll make any difference, but I've got no been, had no reassurance about the, the safety and conflict between cyclists and um, motorists gaining access to the cycle park. Does anybody want to answer that? Uh, Sarah said that we could deal with that, expand the condition to deal with that, Councillor Kerr, and look at the, the details of that, if that is a concern. That it, it may or may not be achievable in a, in a safe But it's manner. something we could have as a pre-commencement or preoccupation condition. Okay, can we move to the vote then? The recommendation is to authorise the director to uh, negotiate a 106 agreement and on the conclusion of that to grant permission. Those in favour of that recommendation? One, two, three. Those against? One, two, three, four, five, six. So that is not agreed. At this point, um, that's not been refused. It is just uh, we haven't gone ahead with the recommendation. Would somebody like to propose something, uh, presumably to refuse permission? You're making a point of order, presumably. Yeah. Because I, I'm not against the principle of redevelopment of this nature in this location. I don't think that, I, I think that something of that additional size, um, regardless of what you said in terms of, of shadowing on the district centre and the um, potential channel of wind, which we have no evidence of, it could shelter it more, um, is, is acceptable. I just don't think the design is appropriate and I don't think we've resolved some of the issues in terms of, of cycle access, which I have no evidence of. Right. So, so I would say, can we defer and allow the officers to have further discussions with the applicant? And I would be happy for that to happen. We can only determine the application that is in front of us, not negotiate another one. OK. Does anybody second Councillor Kerr's proposal? In which case, that falls. Thank you. Um, Councillor Potter. I'll move to refuse the application. Yeah. Thank you. And can you give us some reasons? Yep. I'll say the um, unacceptably high density, overdevelopment, visual impacts, intolerable, the massing, the building, um, and the effect it's going to have on the residents of Alastry, the car parking, etc. Subject to some guidance from the officers uh, <laughs> yes. to, to word that purposefully. Uh, is that seconded? Councillor Hassel, thank you. Those in favour of refusal on the grounds that Councillor Potter has outlined and would be defined by the officers? That is one, two, three, four, five. Those against? One, two, three. So that is carried. Refusal has been carried. Thank you. On then to Agard Street. I'll give people a chance to leave. Very civilised guy tonight, Councillor. Well, they're from Alice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're looking at page 20 then, um, site of 36 Agard Street. And uh, Mr. Bate is going to introduce that to us. Thank you, Chairman. This is an application for an eight-storey building on the existing car park, which you can see uh, on the plan, which fronts Agard Street, currently um, an open area. The eight-storey buildings would support 77 flats. Um, it's not proposed to be student accommodation. Uh, there is associated ground floor 
car parking and other ancillary accommodation, 22 car parking spaces. If we move on to um, the next slide, you can see the site there, surrounded um, by other buildings uh, in the foreground uh, to the south of the site, Frygate. The majority of those buildings are listed. The buildings immediately behind the site are Grade 2 star listed. Um, to the east of the site, towards the city centre, is the uh, uh, Northgate House, the uh, government building. On the opposite side of the road to the north, um, primarily a four-storey student accommodation. And to the, uh, to the west of the site, um, a lower um, buildings, there's a recording studio there and a clinic. Um, so this is looking into the site from Agard Street. You can see the, the government building on the left there, which is set back from the road frontage and uh, goes all the way back to the, uh, the Frygate buildings. Um, immediately behind the site is the small um, former chapel um, connected with Derby Jail. And you can see on the, the right hand of the, of the photo the, the clinic and the recording studio immediately behind that. So this, this is the site here, um, that's the, the ground floor layout. It's got a single access into the site um, to have car parking um, towards the rear. Um, the, the remainder of the, the ground floor accommodation is just a, an entrance suite, offices, and there's cycle and bin storage there um, on the right hand side. Those are the typical layouts of the upper floors. Um, as I say, the 20, uh, sorry, 77 flats. Um, the, the top floors, the top two floors, are set in from the, the main bulk of the, uh, the development and we'll, we'll obviously move to um, see some elevations in a minute. Uh, and those are part of um, some amendments that have been put forward by the applicants to, to reduce the, the visual impact of the proposal. So that's the, the site. Um, as it is at the moment with the government building on the on the left that's looking westwards um, up Agard Street with the, with the traffic on the one-way system coming towards us. Um, that's the artist impression um, 3D, uh, sorry, uh, artist impression of the, the building um, on that site. As I say, the, the top two stories um, are set in um, and with a different method of cladding to uh, reduce the visual impact. Um, and the, this is the existing slide looking um, towards the city centre. Um, the, the clinic building is the, the low building in the, in the foreground. And the next slide will show, uh, again, artist's impression of, of how it would look um, from, from that particular angle. Those, that's the elevation from the front. I think we might have another one. No, that's the rest, the rest of it. Okay. Um, so it's, it's a, an angular block. Um, the top two floors have been set in um, through those amended plans with different materials, but it's, it's mainly in brick with, with some grey cladding. The site itself is currently open land, as I said, used for car parking. Um, the buildings around there are primarily um, lower rise um, mainly four or five storeys. Um, all the buildings to the rear, um, Frygate, which are mainly in office use, uh, four-storey buildings, they are listed buildings. The site itself is within the Frygate conservation area. Um, and as I said, there is a grade two star listed building, um, Frygate, immediately behind the site, and also St. John's Church, which is um, at the junction with uh, Bridge Street, just further west. Um, there's been no late representations to the report, but members will probably be aware of an email which has been circulated by the applicant, um, and I will uh, will comment on that later. In terms of the applicant's submissions, there have been numerous supporting documents, uh, and they outline the general planning benefits of the scheme, and that's covered at page 23 of the report. In terms of representations, there's been 42 objections to the application. Uh, and two in support. The main concerns, though, relate to the impact of the proposal, um, particularly during construction, um, on the adjoining recording studio uh, business. Uh, there's also been strong support for the proposal from Marketing Derby. 
um, and their comments are listed at page 24. In terms of consultation responses, there have been strong objections on heritage grounds, both from our own conservation officer, from the Conservation Area Advisory Committee, and importantly from Historic England. Environmental protection have got concerns over noise nuisance, which could be the subject of a condition, uh, also in terms of land contamination, which may need further investigation, but primarily there are concerns over the impact of the proposal on air quality and the potential of what's called a canyon effect of the proposal um, because the building is set very close or would be set very close to the road frontage um, and environmental protection object to the application on air quality grounds. The Council's regeneration team support the proposal and they say it would complement other regeneration development projects. There have been no objections from highways subject to conditions um, that would include the approval of a travel plan. And there have been no objections from other consultees such as land drainage and the county archaeologists. As I say, members have been sent an email from the applicants which, as you would expect, puts forward supportive comments. And you'll be hearing from the applicant's heritage consultant uh, in a moment. As the applicant state in that email, the decision before you tonight is primarily one of balance between the impact of the proposed development on the surrounding heritage assets and the perceived public benefits of the proposal. As I say, the Council have been advised by both professional conservation officer and by experts from Historic England. Um, Historic England conclude their comments by stating that the proposal would constitute an inappropriate and intrusive development that would result in harm to the significance of a number of listed buildings and would have a harmful impact on the character and appearance of the Frygate Conservation Area. So turning to the planning issues themselves, firstly, the principle of the development uh, is probably acceptable. It, it is an unused brownfield site and if it's supported, it would contribute to the housing mix and the windfall housing allowance. However, the po positive benefits, which would include any public benefits, must, as I said, be balanced against other issues, primarily the impact on heritage assets and the creation of a high-quality living environment for future residents. In terms of the impact on heritage assets, the heritage bodies conclude that there is less than substantial harm caused by the impact of the proposal on the surrounding conservation area and those listed buildings. However, this harm must be weighed against any public benefits. Those are set out on page 46 of the report, and officers consider that those benefits would not outweigh the harm, and that is primarily the first reason for refusal that we're recommending. In terms of the design and visual, Im uh, visual impact, um, it is accepted that the amendments have improved the visual appearance of the proposal, but there remain concerns over the height, the scale and its massing, particularly in terms of the position of the block very close to the highway and the impact on the surrounding lower buildings. The proposal would be very dominant and have an enclosing effect on the street scene. In terms of other amenity issues, of particular concern is the impact on the adjoining recording studios and also how the street canyon effect of the development would impact on air quality. And as set out above, uh, environmental protection maintain their objection on air quality grounds. So the recommendation is to refuse on those, those uh, three particular matters. If, however, members are minded to approve the scheme, then I would suggest that the decision would need to be deferred to allow negotiations for a Section 106 agreement to be agreed uh, in respect of any developer contributions. But the recommendation as it stands is to refuse. Thank you, Chen. Thank you. Uh, we have Mr. Phipps uh, from the uh, applicants, would you like to come forward? Like everybody else, you have three minutes. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, my name is John Phipps. I'm a director at uh, Latham's. Uh, we're architects and urban designers based in Derby. Uh, I'm an architect, planner, and heritage consultant. And uh, <clears throat> in terms of this scheme, uh, I have provided the applicant for 36 Agard Street with heritage, townscape, and visual impact uh, advice. Um, 
In terms of uh, the, the overview of the scheme, uh, it's, as was previously stated, uh, the comments made by Historic England and uh, your uh, conservation officer have been understood and taken seriously, and the applicant has made every effort to modify the scheme uh, accordingly. Um, the uh, detailed evidence which uh, underpinned our visual assessment uh, of the application site and the surrounding area uh, objectively identified where possible harmful impacts upon the historic environment may be located. Uh, in my view, the undeveloped site presently at 36 Agar Street is harmful to the character of the conservation area as it stands uh, and to the setting of the rear of uh, 47 to 51 Frygate. Uh, Agar Street as a whole, although it falls within the boundary of the conservation area, is of very little uh, uh, townscape or heritage value, as you'll note if you walk down it in the previous photographs uh, indicated, uh, despite the fact it's in the conservation area boundary. Uh, and it's acknowledged that Agard Street as a whole is an area in uh, a process of flux and change. There's been several applications put in and there's been several approved and developed schemes. Uh, the scheme is, as it stands, the proposal is not invisible, uh, clearly, it's, you can see it, and, uh, but being seen in a conservation area does not necessarily equate to visual harm. So that is uh, something which should be borne in mind. Um, the principal heritage asset within the conservation area is the Frygate frontage, the uniform and consistent uh, townscape composition of Frygate is uh, the critical asset. And that is not harmed <coughs> by the application. You cannot see the scheme from any point on Frygate. We've tested that and it's, the evidence has been provided. Uh, it's acknowledged that there are some secondary views uh, from beyond Frygate uh, where the scheme will uh, be seen and it will lead to uh, possible harm, but it will be less than substantial uh, minor harm. Uh, and as said, you can't develop schemes without them being seen, so just being seen does not equate necessarily to visual harm. Uh, whilst we respect the views of Historic England and the um, uh, um, Conservation Officer, we do not agree with their assessments uh, of harm, uh, which in both cases are very thin on identifying where heritage significance is located. I have to stop you there. Thank you very much. You've had your okay. three minutes. But clear on the impacts. Okay, thanks. Mr. Bate, would you like to come back on anything that's been raised? Thank you, Chairman. I think the, the only thing to say is that I, I probably agree with what Mr. Phipps is saying, but he, he has conceded that there is less than substantial harm, and that, that is precisely what our report says. It's, it's the balance that has to be then put in terms of whether there are sufficient public benefits from the proposal which outweigh that harm. Um, Officers believe in the recommendation to refuse it, that there aren't benefits there, and that's why we're recommending refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Members of the committee, Councillor Howard. Oh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> this proposal is to replace one of the eyesores of Agard Street, the government building. Or... or I, I, well, it's next to it. Can, can I just correct you? That yeah. government building, which didn't need planning... Uh, well, I, that's the point I want to make. It remains. Yeah. It's empty, okay. but it remains. Yeah. It, it, well, I, it may not replace it, but certainly that building is an eyesore, the bigger eyesore than anything else that can be put in Agar Street, in my opinion. So, will this make any difference? Will it improve? No, it won't. But certainly won't be any worse for it. And I agree with the uh, people that like marketing Derby, who are in favour of it, and a resident who also makes a comment in favour of it on page 25. I, I feel that already there are many buildings in this street that I was, and that was against, but they went ahead. And I don't think this is any different to those. Yes, I know what the officers are saying, but I don't think this building will make any difference whatsoever in that area. And in view of the fact there are many buildings already similar, then in my opinion, how can we turn it down? And I certainly will be voting in favour. Um, Mr. Teasdale is going to advise us.
Yeah, I, I think I just need to clarify in terms of what uh, you probably need to focus on in terms of the the initial sort of consideration. As the officers point out, and pointed out, uh, the, the heritage officer, uh, officer the um, English heritage, uh, heritage, historic England, sorry now, I'm living in the past a bit, um, have, have sort of given you sort of a clear indication that they think there is harm, albeit less than substantial harm, and, and even the applicant's uh, um, consultant tonight acknowledges there's less than substantial harm. That, that raises a presumption against grant. You've, so the test that you will uh, to overcome that is to look at what the public benefits are against the, the harm. And if the public benefits do not overcome that harm, then, the, as I said, the presumption is to, gra uh, to, to refuse. Sorry, did I say to grant? Uh, to refuse. So, um, so, I mean, effectively, it doesn't really matter w um, if the building um, is hiding something else or whatever. It's a public benefits that you're looking at. And, and they, as, as the officers said, as, have been listed at... At par uh, on page 46, you've got to consider whether those overcome the harm. The, another point actually to raise in relation to that is that um, in relation to some of the benefits that have been listed, the, we, uh, there may be other alter, uh, developments that would provide those public of lesser harm that might provide those public benefits. So those are issues that you really need to focus on as a starting point tonight. <coughs> Councillor Rawson, then Councillor Froggart, then Councillor Kerr. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I, th I think that um, this does boil down really to uh, a finely balanced judgment really between the benefits of um, the additional housing um, and um, the potential or perceived harm to heritage assets and um, the air quality issues that we have to take into account as well. Um, on, on the benefits side, um, the City Council does have a policy of actively encouraging um, city centre living um, for a number of really good reasons um, to um, reduce the pressure on uh, greenfield sites uh, around the city. Um, we're constantly saying that we should be prioritising brownfield sites uh, and, and this is, is certainly one of those. Um, there's the benefits for the city centre economy in terms of uh, people living, w working, spending their money um, in, in the city centre. Um, so those are, those are the, the plus sides. Um, We've got the, um, the highways report, which says that um, uh, in neither case um, the additional number of trips um, are significant when set against the existing volume of traffic in Agard Street. Um, so the, the number of uh, parking spaces um, are not going to have uh, any significant impact on the highways. Um, and I'm just wondering really how that feeds into the, the issues with, with air quality because if we're saying it's not going to generate any significant um, additional uh, car journeys, um, what is the, uh, where is the, um, the additional um, concerns around air quality coming from? Um, so that's, that's one point. Um, on page 25 as well we have the, the cycle spaces and it, uh, the report suggesting that that could be increased to 16, um, doubled. Um, so um, if it were to be approved then I would um, strongly encourage that, that we look at conditioning additional cycle spaces. Um, and then we come to really the concerns about the the, the heritage and the impact um, and from from my point of view really the um, the issue is around how visible this building will be from Frygate which is um, the um, the conservation area um, it is uh, probably the crown jewels in terms of uh, Derby's heritage assets and we've heard that this building won't be visible from 
uh, from Frygate itself. Um, it may, in fact, it will be visible, I guess, from the gardens and the rear of the buildings on Frygate. Um, but is that really um, such a big issue and such a big deal? That's something that members of the committee, all of us, will have to consider. For me, a far b bigger deal is whether it's visible from, from Frygate itself. Um, so that's, uh, that's that point. Um, I've got a bit of a concern as well about the, the sort of the, um, the cladding on the V, um, the second to top floor. Um, we've had discussions about this in the past really um, and whether that adds to or detracts from the um, appearance of the building. Um, my, my own personal view would probably be it, it would be better to um, to continue with the brick facade um, right up until the top uh, top floor. Um, so again, being new to planning, I'm not sure whether we can mandate that in any way or whether <laughs> whether we accept uh, what we've got in front of us uh, or, uh, uh, or or reject it. Um, so the. Um, just finally finishing on the air, air quality issues and it, it talks about this street canyon effect. From the picture we've got in front of us on the screen, it doesn't actually look too much of a, a canyon to me. It's, we're considering this one application here this evening. There may be future applications for other buildings along uh, Agard Street in the future, um, which may or may not create a canyon effect. Um, but um, my view would be we're considering this application and not trying to look forward into the future as to what, what may or may not be coming. So um, I um, personally can't, uh, can't see um, the can so-called canyon effect that's mentioned um, um, providing... Um, being, being particularly relevant to this application. It's this one building we're looking at and um, I'm not convinced that that creates a canyon effect. Um, the other point as well is in, in terms of air quality, the council's obviously got to take steps to, um, to address that um, through um, uh, government uh, is, is mandating that. Um, so I, I don't also understand why this particular application is being singled out for mention in terms of air quality. Um, as I've said, the, there's no extra car journey has been identified from it. Um, you could say that to, uh, you, um, you could apply the same principle to any uh, built application that comes forward in, in the city centre. Um, it's potentially going to create um, uh, extra air quality issues so we don't uh, we, we, we don't approve any further uh, applications in the city centre so um, perhaps just have a few comments on that that would be helpful. We, we do have an environmental health officer here who can advise us on the air quality questions you rose spe spe specifically can can I invite you to do so? Yeah. Thank you chair um, yeah I mean um, certainly in the world of air quality what you're starting to see down Agar Street, and I completely acknowledge that this probably is talking about the future as well, where you're talking about a full line of buildings on either side of the road, but what you're looking at on Agard Street is exactly the worst situation that you can possibly get in air quality terms. You're getting a narrow street, and you're getting high-sided buildings on either side. Um, and what that means is that, um, and also what you're getting is a lot of traffic and particularly what you do get on Agard Street, which is also a, a big problem, is queuing traffic. Um, so all of those things together make it pretty much one of the worst, worst, worst sort of situations you can get for air, air pollution. Um, and what the reason for that is what we've got on Agard Street at the moment is already a poor air quality situation. It's within our City Council air quality management area. The levels, um, particularly of nitrogen dioxide, are already very close to the national objectives for nitrogen dioxide. Um, and what you've already got on one side of the street are relatively high-rise buildings. And what this would do in that particular location is put another building very close to the road and what it does is it limits the dispersion. So what happens in effect is all the emissions coming from the vehicles, it can't just disperse away into the space that there is now. It 
down what is called what's called a downwash effect and it in effect the pollution just turns in on itself and blows back into the street um, so you know it just it stops the air being able to disperse um, it's a double fold as well because obviously the creation of the building causes that effect but what you're also doing of course is you're introducing new receptors new people new occupants of a building that wasn't there before into a location where we know that there are already air quality problems um, and the third issue is of course that you've got already got occupants on the other side of the street in the residential um, flats that are four-story flats on the northern side um, and what's happening is that because it's creating the canyon effect it is then increasing the pollution levels for those people as well so it really is kind of a mix of the worst circumstances you can you can possibly think of really um, in terms of air pollution i appreciate the development itself isn't really adding to air pollution in terms of traffic numbers and that's obviously that's a positive um, but but because of the fact it's introducing new receptors new people living there it's exposing people to levels of pollution that we already know are bad plus the creation of building is increasing those levels um, and, that, and that's the reason for the objection. Thank you, that's very helpful. Uh, Councillor Froggart. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Rawson has covered a lot of my points. Thank you. Uh, I am a little confused with the air quality, especially with the clean air zone coming in before much longer. Surely that should have an impact. Um, also, I know it might be a bit further down the line, but if this does get permission, as a regular driver down Agard Street, with, if the works do commence, can we ask the Highways Development Control Centre to open the bus lane to traffic turning right at the bottom of Frygate instead of everybody getting stuck on Agard Street, please, <laughs> as in the last development? You make a very valid, valid point, and I sympathise with it. However, it's nothing to do with the application, but uh, it's been heard by the relevant officers, whom I'm sure will be out there tomorrow morning with their cameras. <laughs> OK. Count Councillor Kerr. Thank you. The, we, we're trying very hard to move to an improved um, walking environment in the city. And this has got loads of people already living on this street where where the walking environment is, we've already heard, pretty poor. And it's not just the air quality that matters, it's actually also the space that you've got to walk. And the, the footway on the, um, on the, in the drawing that we've got at the moment, it's the north side of the road, the, the left-hand side of the road, is standard. We can't do anything about that. At the far end, where we've got what is now the university building, they've actually been a bit more generous, and there's a bit of extra space being provided for pedestrians there. So at the very least of a building like this, and if we imagine that we've, we've now got only electric vehicles and we haven't got a problem with, with nitrous oxide problems and whatever, then I think we should be saying we want to set the building back, not by the 15 metres to solve all the air quality issues, but at least sufficiently so that we can actually enable people to be walking in a space that they want to choose to walk in rather than feeling they're forced to walk very cl closer to people than they would choose. And that is part of developing a... Um, an environment which people want to behave in, in the way we want people to behave, to be more active, to be making choices in those ways. As it's designed at the moment, it just seems to me as if we've got this footprint, we're going to build up as much as we can, as high as we can, we're going to maximise the number of, of flats, and this is what we've come up with. We've already heard that the top two stories have been set back after discussions to do that, and it just seems to me that we're cramming too much into the space. If we look at the front view of the front face of the building, and this comes back to the, the design, this is inside a conservation area. We should be putting here properties that, that enhance the area. Look at that. What does it immediately strike you? It's lopsided. Why haven't we got a plan that actually gives you some sort of symmetry to a building? If we're going to have a building, we can't set, set that. Set, uh, sit back very far and look at it because of its location too close to the road. But if we could sit back and look at it, why are we building a brand new building which is aesthetically not quite symmetrical? I, I think it's done because we are putting 11 flats on each building, on each floor, and that works better for the flat layout. But that shouldn't be our priority for a conservation area. 
if we're going to put a building there, and I'm not dead against the size of it, it I think it's a bit too, it's too close to the road, but not, uh, if, we have, if we don't have an air quality problem, it's not too, too close to the road. It just needs to be a bit further back to be giving us sort of space to live in. But for me, a conservation area design needs to say it's got some architectural merit. And that, for me, I'm sorry, that is an absolute no. And for me, I turn it down on design, non-symmetrical design in a conservation area is a problem. I've also got other issues. Uh, the air quality, I do not think we've solved. And I think the air quality is something that we would need to think about for people walking through the area, not just living in those buildings and the existing dwellers on the other side who aren't going to have enhanced air conditioning or something because we can't condition that for the world building on, that already exists. Um, I think the secondary views do matter, um, but we haven't been shown them. We haven't been shown a fly-through, and I think to have had a fly-through of this building that we've had for other larger buildings has been helpful in the past. Um, I think the cycle parking, there were a few issues about as well in terms of the numbers. We need to look at that. I'd like to know if we're getting a PV or a green roof on this building. Um, but for me, I'm sorry, conservation area, let's build something that we'd want to look at. Thank you. Um, I, perhaps I can echo Councillor West when she was here a couple of meetings ago and said, if we're going to have conservation areas, uh, why bother with them unless we're there to protect them? And I think she was absolutely right. I'm in no doubt that this site should be built on. Um, it's an eyesore at the moment. It needs something on it. If you want to look at what works in Agard Street, look on the other side of the road. There's student accommodation, at reasonable height, nice balconies. If we can look at the other picture, can somebody bring that one up? That's it, yep. Now, those have got balconies on the front, um, and you can see in this picture sunlight shining on them. Well. That's impossible because if that building were there, which is on the southern side, it would block out the sunlight for most of the day, which would mean if you lived in one of those flats, your amenities would be seriously degraded and you'd need to keep your lights on in that front room all day long pretty well. Uh, and what's the point of having a balcony if you, could, you can only look out at that? One or two people mentioned, including Latham's, who I have every respect, respect for, um, that from a listed building point of view, it's only the frontage of Friargate that we need to consider. No, it isn't. And it's not up to us to decide whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. That's, that's written in, into statute. A grade one listed building, and certainly a grade two star build, uh, listed building, you need to consider the setting. And yes, that does mean the views from the garden. It does mean the views from the, the windows of, of uh, um, uh, Pickford House, uh, which is the grade one building. And, and yeah, it's, it's the setting of that. It's a conservation area with a lot of um, listed buildings and historic England have uh, made it quite clear that their views on that. We have a recommendation to refuse planning permission those in favour of refusal on the grounds that are listed there. Thank you. That is one, two, three, four, five. Uh, those against, one, two, three, one, two, three. So permission for that is refused on the grounds listed in the report. Thank you. We move now to two fairly similar applications, but we must deal with them both on their own merits. Uh, first one is in 27 Hollis Street, um, change of use from dwelling house to an eight bed house in multiple occupation. And Mr. Woodhead is going to address that for us. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first and foremost, housekeeping items to update the report. Number one, um, apologies to members for the duplication of reason one of the previous refusal as highlighted on page 54. That's repeated under reason two also. Reason two of that uh, refusal dealt with the unacceptable dormer extensions in the rear roof plane and in the rear roof plane of the outrigger under the previous application. So uh, apologies for that. Secondly, on page 55, members are advised about the additional notification period that has been carried out to publicise the amended plans which include the proposed dormer extension. 
Uh, the letter that we've sent specifically refers to that amendment and 19 households, including Councillor Graves and Bailey, have also been notified. And finally, to accommodate that additional neighbour notification period that extends up to the 24th of July, the recommendation on page 59 needs to be amended to something like, subject to the expiry of the additional publicity period on the 24th of July 2018, to grant planning permission with conditions in consultation with the Chair and Vice-Chair, subject to there being no substantive objections raised during the additional publicity period. I'm sure Mr Teasdale can pull me up if he thinks he needs to be any rewording of that, but that's just to accommodate the additional notification period that we've done. <coughs> Chair, this application follows the previous refusal of planning permission for the creation of a house in multiple occupation with a dormer extension in the rear roof plane to accommodate addi additional bedroom space. As your report states, the application seeks to address the previous reasons for refusal, and this includes the following. Firstly, the removal of the proposed ground floor rear extension that was deemed unacceptable in its scale and form, and which was addressed under reason one of the previous refusal. Secondly, reductions in scale of the proposed rear dormer extension and removal of the dormer that was proposed on the rear outrigger of the property. So that that part of the dormer extended back at 90 degrees uh, from, the, from the main house. So it was a, an L-shaped dormer. So we've now just got a dormer in the back roof plane of the main roof, sort of a conventional sort of dormer extension. And thirdly, the completion of a parking survey to provide more information about on-street parking conditions on Hollis Street to address the concerns addressed under reason three of the previous refusal. And Paul can talk about that if he, if he wants to later. Chair, the previous scheme included eight bedrooms across the three floors of the property, and the current proposal includes six bedrooms, albeit with a stated intent of accommodating up to eight people. In this case, I am satisfied that the overall intensity of the proposal, in terms of the scale of the accommodation provided, is reasonable in this residential setting. I'm also satisfied that the omission of the single-storey rear extension and reduction in scale of the proposed dormer extension are welcome reductions in the built form that was previously proposed. We have to be mindful, of course, that a large family household could accommodate the same number of people in a dwelling house, and the dormer could be a permitted development extension if it was proposed on a residential dwelling. The concerns of colleagues in Highways Development Control have been satisfied in terms of the impact uh, of the proposal on on-street parking conditions, and the site is sustainably located near to London Road and the Alverston District Centre. Subject to various internal issues, the accommodation will be separately regulated under the Housing Act and there are no overriding objections to the application from colleagues in housing standards. Uh, see page 56 of your report for their commentary. Members will note, of course, that the proposal has generated strong objections from local residents and these are echoed by the ward members who are here tonight to articulate those concerns. However, Chair, in this case, I consider there are no reasonable planning policy grounds to resist this proposal and feel that the applicant has properly addressed the reasons for refusal of the previous application. Again, Chair, subject to the expiry of the publicity period and the amended recommendation, I promote the po positive recommendation and invite the ward members to address committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, have you decided which of you is going to go first? Um, Toss a coin or something, I don't mind which whichever it is. Perhaps you do it the other way around for the, the next one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mr Chairman and members of the committee, I'm here to object to this application on behalf of all the residents of Hollis Street and many of the residents in surrounding streets. I spoke at full council some time ago about the difficulties of houses of multiple occupation and changes to family homes into flats. In, is having on many areas of Derby, especially Alverston Ward. The application may be sound in planning terms, however it is not sound for the permanent residents in Hollis Street. Hollis Street is a small cul-de-sac which is off the very busy London Road, an arterial road of Derby. Hollis Street has also been subjected to three other HMOs in recent times, changing three bedroom family homes into eight bedroom houses of multiple occupation, none of which have increased their parking capabilities. I know of two families who have left their long-term homes and others that are thinking of it. As the local authority, we have a responsibility for ensuring that our actions keep the city the best we can. 
You, as planning members, have a huge part to play to ensure our family homes remain family homes. It is a fact that HMOs attract transient people. They are naturally transient because these dwellings are not family forever homes. Transient people are less likely to care about their surroundings and their new temporary districts. It's not a criticism, it's merely a fact. I despair at the number of HMOs in this area. When are we, when are you, going to take responsibility for this type of development? Developers are not adding this for the sake of the community. In fact, I believe I am right in saying all developers of this nature do not live in Derby, never mind this vicinity. Planners seem to suggest that eight separate people will only create one or two cars. This is almost never the case and almost always creates one per person. I was quite pleased to hear Councillor Potter talking about parking issues in Alastry. With three HMOs already recently converted in this street, this has ne added nearly 20 extra cars with three parking spaces that do not get used because they park on the street itself. Across the London Road, we also have an outstanding application for nine more flats, currently refused because there was no parking, but will come back at some point in the near future. Hollis Street is also subjected to churchgoers to the church on the corner of the street and London Road because of the lack of adequate parking. The frustration is immense and, as I mentioned, merely forces people to leave their much-loved homes. Mr Chairman and members of the Planning Committee, we simply cannot keep allowing more and more of these to encroach on our community. Alveston suffers because it is a nice place and the houses are relatively cheap, maximising the wealth of faceless, heartless profiteers. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bayliss. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Um, I'm here to uh, ask the Committee to reject this proposal, uh, having read the report. I, I wrote to every single person on that particular street and had a 10% response rate in terms of people objecting to this. Primarily, the reasons are, first, the car parking. The survey itself that was undertaken was inadequate and a snapshot, rather like the one undertaken at the highway office. It's flawed in that it does not take into account the use of the church for weddings, funerals, baptisms, and the Sunday services where vehicles are regularly parked on London Road on the pavement because of lack of space. Holly Street itself is narrow with no turning head, and it can be difficult to park sometimes with vehicles parked opposite a space. In terms of planning issues, that is a material consideration. Turning to the other issues in terms of housing standards in respect of HMO, the layout of the house is poor and barely adequate, and we should be asking for good quality design, exceeding the minimum standards and aspiring for excellence in design, not allowing developers to scrape along the bottom of the requirement. This design, if allowed, would be another degentrification in respect of urban design. But as we all know, this sort of property will be maintained at the lowest standards possible to maximise the income of a landlord and become sadly an eyesore on the street. And one final comment, which has been picked up uh, on the previous applications, if Derby City or Derby Homes were developing this, it would have a sprinkler system, and this does not. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't catch that last sentence. It would what? If Derby Homes or Derby City Council were developing it, it would have a sprinkler system. Thank you, Chair. This is a very difficult problem, isn't it? Um, these, you know, there, there are many, many streets like this in Derby, and I do understand people's frustration, uh, uh, particularly on a cul-de-sac like this. The simple fact is that no one has the right to park in the street. There are a set number of of places. Uh, you know, they're all terracey type houses. And you just simply wouldn't win it appeal. That you wouldn't. I don't know the grounds that you would win at appeal. I don't think it causes a road safety issue, and I think that any inspector, if you went to appeal, would say you, the highway authority, have powers under other acts to control parking. And it's frustrating, but there it is. There's no policy basis for it. My understanding is we are going to look at this in part two of the local plan. Um, but at the minute, there are no grounds that we could substantiate, Chair. Thank you. Members of the committee. Councillor Kerr. 
There was reference to uh, the number of HMOs already in this area. Um, do we have any knowledge about the number in Hollis Street itself or in Hollis Street plus adjacent streets? And do we have any policy that relates to the numbers of HMOs in the same way as we do in terms of the number of fast food outlets, for example, that we could we could draw on? Or is that something that we should be referring to officers to look at in terms of part two, which won't affect this application, but could mean that further in the future applications we have more policy that we can consider? Yes, yeah, so there's, no, there's no policy currently, and um, we don't have records of the number of HMOs um, in the street, but it's, it's a bit of a funny situation with, with HMOs because you have a residential dwelling where you could have a single family household with any number of people in there living as a, a single family household. Now, that, that, could, that could accommodate a far, far greater number of people, and we have no control over that. With housing multiple occupation, you're really looking at impact and, and what, what impact does that have? How does it change the character? So you've got the issue of parking, of course, and Paul's indicated that to, to, to demonstrate harm with one HIMO within the context of that street and, you know, possibly the counter argument that people who live in HIMOs may be less likely to afford to run a car than people living in a family home where there may be two or three car owners. That's part of the argument. So it's, it's a very difficult area of, 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 of trying to put together a policy in the part two to demonstrate that impact. Is it an impact on character? Are you, are you concerned about the transient nature of a population? Is it changing the character of Alveston or that part of Alveston? Certain uni big university cities like Oxford do have policies relating to HIMOs and their concentration thereof. But whether or not we've got that same level of impact um, I wouldn't know, but if, if you felt that it's a policy area that needed looking at, then it would be moving forward in the part two, but then it would be an issue as to how do you actually look at that impact? Because in this case, the extensions to the property are commensurate with a, a residential dwelling, so it would look like a dwelling. It would have six bedrooms and possibly eight people, but then you could have that in a residential dwelling itself. So where do you, in, where do you show character impact? in that context, so it's a very difficult area. Um, Paul's mentioned the, the parking situation, and I would concur, if you got to appeal, any inspector would say, well, you're in a sustainable location, you're close to a main road, you're close to a district centre, this affords people who may live in a high mode the opportunity to use that district centre. I think we would be struggling, to say the least, at appeal. But I can take your concerns forward and discuss it with our policy team as we move forward into the part two. Because there are areas in the city you know, that, that do have high-mo concentrations, particularly the University District, Kettleston Road, uh, and then you get into the debate about student accommodation, bespoke student accommodation, taking away those high-mos and putting them into bespoke student accommodation, thus releasing houses back into the open market. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big area to look at. That answer your question, Councillor Kerr. It, it does, um, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I would welcome us... I'm putting a recommendation, Chair, if we may, to, to the um, planning officers who are looking at part two, for them to consider this as an aspect to look at. And for me, it is the social aspects that make a difference. And it's not just that you may have um, six people who are not related to each other, but there also it's the transient nature. It's the way that people may not have as much commitment to that area because they're aspiring to go somewhere else. They might be here for part of the week and living somewhere else for part of, part of the week without a commitment to their locality. It may be the way in which the gardens are not maintained because nobody actually knows whether their landlord wants them to look after the garden or not. And anyway, they haven't got any garden tools and not going to buy them. So it's those sorts of issues as well that, that proper management of an HMO doesn't necessarily solve. I have sympathy, but we have to look purely from the planning application point yeah, of view. Yeah, we don't have any policy the, to do any of that now. The, the, the test I always say is, would I want this opposite my house? And the answer is no, and I would do everything I could to stop it. But I do know that you need um, proper reasons to do that, and that's understandable. Councillor Evan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm in agreement with uh, Lucy and my fellow ward councillors. Uh, we, we need to take responsibility, really. If we're changing the, 
the heart of what these properties were built for. We know we can't stand still in time, but generally these are family homes here. And if we have got an issue and we want to provide HMOs, then that should be considered and there should be separate buildings really that have been fully thought through. We shouldn't have this haddock where we just convert properties to HMOs. Uh, we're changing Derby too much. Uh, we're losing that sentiment and family value. And uh, I'm certainly uh, going to be voting against it. Thank you. Any other speakers? Uh, Councillor Rawson. Yes, um, thank you. It, it's just really to sort of echo the, the unees that uh, other members of the committee have, um, have, have stated. Um, when these streets were built originally, they weren't designed for uh, houses in multiple o occupation. They weren't designed um, for the number of cars and vehicles um, that that generates. Um, where, where there's a family home, you might have one or two vehicles. If you've got a house in multiple op occupation, you might have eight vehicles. Um, and if there are others in the same street, then the problem's multiplied um, many times over. Um, so it's, uh, I, I would welcome as part of the part two um, some um, further work on this and um, uh, some uh, studies um, because if there are particular parts of Derby that are, uh, that are f affected then um, you know, we do need to be um, uh, putting in some additional policy around that to enable committee to, um, uh, to be able to be much more robust in um, in resisting some of these applications. Um, I think um, the points that the ward councillors, um, Councillor Bayliss has made are extremely valid and um, uh, it's, it just doesn't feel that this is a suitable location um, for this um, particular uh, this particular use. Um, so I'm struggling to support it as well, Chair. Yeah. Any other speakers? In which case, the recommendation is to grant planning permission with conditions. Those in favour? That's one, two, three, four. Those against? One, two, three, four, five. So that has not been granted. It hasn't been refused either. Would somebody like to move uh, a recommendation to refuse and give reasons? Well, somebody's got to. <laughs> Councillor Rawson, would you like to give the reasons? Because you'll probably have to defend them at appeal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, uh, in terms of uh, parking, um, f um, in terms of um, uh, the significant extension to the property um, it being inappropriate in um, this particular location, uh, massing and the effect on, of that on, on neighbouring properties. Okay, is that seconded? Councillor Froggart, thank you. And um, subject to the officers wording that into an appropriate uh, recommendation, um, can I have those in favour of refusal on those grounds? That is one, two, three, four, five. Uh, those against? One. Uh, Councillor Potter, have you got your hand up or not? <laughs> right, one, two, three. Okay, so that, that is refused um, for the reasons stated. Chair, so, um, uh, I was going to refer uh, back to this on Carsington House, but, um, but I will do subsequently. Um, as it's been refused, it's normal practice for uh, committee to nominate somebody to represent at any appeal? Yeah, on, on Cussington House I did ask Councillor Potter to do that and he agreed. Um, can I have a volunteer to represent the committee? Thank you, Councillor Rawson. Thank you. Okay, let's move on then to Brighton Road. Um, I suspect we'll hear some similar arguments. Uh, again, it is for change of use from dwelling house to an eight-bed multiple house in multiple occupation. Uh, it's 135 Brighton Road, and that's on page 62. And again, it's uh, Mr Woodhead that's going to introduce it to us. Thank you, Chair. Uh, again, to tidy up the main 
report, I need to add uh, DCLP policy CP6 to the list of policies for completeness. That's got omitted for some reason. Again, Chair, this application seeks planning permission to change the use of this dwelling house to a house in multiple occupancy. The proposed internal conversion would create an eight-bedroom property. As with the Hollis Street application, the proposal has generated an objection which is echoed by Councillor Graves and the main concerns surround the erosion of the established family oriented character of the area and concerns surrounding general disturbance and parking issues. Officers have carefully considered the proposal but ultimately feel that reasonable objections cannot be sustained on policy grounds in terms of the residential amenity impact of the proposal. There are no objections from housing standards colleagues to the scale and nature of the internal accommodation, thus assisting planning officers uh, with the opinion that reasonable living environments would be created, and there are also no objections on highways grounds in this location. Again, Chair, you've got Councillor Bayliss, who I assume will go first this time, and Councillor Graves. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the idea of this particular design can be s considered as a good one. Again, is uh, far from the truth. I'm here again to speak against the application and ask the committee to reject the application. Firstly, talking at car parking, the idea that the design can be considered uh, car free is a bit of a nonsense. There were cars generated by this development, and the idea that a survey at 7.15 on a weekday is credible is frankly laughable. It takes no account of the effect of match day parking when Derby County at home, nor the traffic using it as a rat run in the morning and the afternoon rush hour. It also ignores the fact this is a quite a well-used route to school for the uh, school at Lakeside on uh, London Road. In terms of housing standards, here again we have what seems to be a race to the bottom. The diner kitchen is actually undersized in the report if you read it, and as such fails the standard by my judgment and should be rejected because of that. I note the developer is aware of our HMO uh, amenity and licensing standards, but seems with officer agreement skating around them. I make the point we should be encouraging high quality designs for, and for people to come forward with designs that exceed our standards. This, uh, I'm afraid, is far from that. And in that section of uh, Brighton Road, we have a development that says design and use that actually, again, degentrifies the urban street scene. And again, we know that this sort of property will not be maintained to the highest standard, but to the lowest possible to maintain the income of the landlord and become yet again a, a nice on the street scene. And I make the point again, if we, Derby City was doing this or Derby Homes are doing this, we ourselves will be incorporating sprinklers in it and this system, this house and this development doesn't have that. And the, the planning uh, regulations don't incorporate that because the Conservative lead at the time rejected them to be incorporated, if memory serves me correctly. Thank you, Chair. I can't confirm or deny that, actually, but, uh, okay. Um, it has been stated several times this evening that sprinklers are a matter for building regulations, not planning. Councillor Graves. Thank you very much. Mr Chairman and members of the committee, this is the same issue as Hollis Street. Brighton Road is not a salubrious area, but is home to many families. It already has an apartment accommodation with adequate parking dotted along its route. The mix of homes are mainly terraced and road space is limited on a per capita basis. Brighton Road is being targeted by entrepreneurs trying to make a quick buck on the backs of the poorest in our community. In the last 12 months, I'm aware of three other HMOs, all next to each other on Brighton Road, a current application to convert the chip shop into six flats, similar applications in Chambers Street and other neighbouring streets. Parking is a massive issue in this area, as is traffic. It is affected by the sheer number of existing built vehicles. It is affected by football traffic, which the council has done very little about. And as the local neighbourhood board, we are even introducing a one-way system to try and alleviate some of those issues. This development will only make this situation worse. You have to ask yourself, why is this part of Alveston under attack? The devastation to the community and the fabric of society. Because developers want to make lots of money, not because it's good for, for the long-term residents. Alveston has taken its fair share of this type of development, and the people of Alveston are looking for you to stop any further encroachments. Please help them by rejecting this application. I'd just like to make one point about what Mr. Woodhead talked about um, in terms of um, uh, the fact that you can have many uh, 
members of a family living in one house and that doesn't affect the development. I agree with him. However, they are long-term residents. HMOs create transient residents. That means they're not so bothered about the areas they live in. There's a massive difference. Thank you. Um, there were some parking issues there. Anything to add to what you said earlier? Chair, perhaps, uh, thank you, Chair. I'll perhaps just point out what I, I think are some little, a few differences here. This is, I think the difference here is this is not a cul-de-sac, so you've got a little bit more spread. But uh, again, uh, look, what we would have to do, what anybody has to do when we get to appeal, um, is you've got to show that the difference between this being a dwelling house and this being a HMO, that difference, that difference by degree, prov provides a, a severe impact on the highway. And it's just impossible to do, I'm afraid. I think you could even argue that this creates an additional parking space the way it's laid out. Um, I think the parking space on the front is we've, we've said is, is not workable. It's, 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 they've shown us a car there that you couldn't get in. Unless it moves sideways. Yeah, yeah. okay. Right, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kerr. We're in the same situation here as we were last time without any proper policy on HMOs. And the need for that policy is, is we're just seeing we need it. So um, reinforce the comment from last time that it needs to be considered as part of our part two. The second issue that we have here is, again, parking. And we don't know whether people are going to live here with cars or without cars. But either way, if you're going to be a cyclist, you don't want to have to walk to the bottom of the garden to collect your bicycle in the rain. I know you're going to cycle in the rain, but it's still, it's just... The mindset of walking through that unkept garden to a shed at the bottom of the garden where you hope no one's broken in in the middle of the night to collect your bike is not what you want to do. If we're going to have cycle parking, it needs to be convenient to where you live, just as you want to park your car just outside the house. So I'm sorry, look, it's no good conditioning a solution that ain't good enough. Can we please get our pe people to come forward with cycle parking that works for cyclists? Thank you. Anybody else? Anything? Councillor Rawson. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I mean, it's, the, the issues are very similar to the, um, uh, the application that we've just considered. Uh, parking in this particular area is uh, going to be uh, affected. Uh, and um, I just reiterate the point I made in, in my previous comments. Um, if you've got eight or however many people in a HMO, they're all likely to have their own vehicle and they've got to park them somewhere and um, it's just not going to work on uh, terraced and small residential streets such as this. Um, so that's my view, Chair. Thank you. Any others? Thanks, Chair. I think we've um, all discussed this and I support Councillor Care. We need a policy on HMOs, don't we? And we need it pretty damn soon because it's, it's critical that we know what we're talking about here. And so if I support you, Lucy, and let, let's, get this, let's get some form of document so we know what we're talking about. Thank you. Okay, Mr Woodhead. Yeah, I mean, we, we are looking at these. I mean, we, the absence of a specific HIMO policy, we, we're still looking at this contextually as a residential use in a residential area and considering the amenity impact as to what can be accommodated there in terms of a, a residential dwelling and what the, the house in multiple occupation is and what the demonstrable harm or impact is of that HIMO relative to the dwelling house. So we are considering these factors because we don't have a specific HIMO policy. It's not that we are being uh, sort of derelict in our duty over considering it. And we have to, main, as Paul has um, indicated, in terms of parking, and when you arrive at appeal with an inspector, he will say, please demonstrate severe impact here. And you, you, you are then saying, well, it's a residential dwelling that could accommodate four, five, six people uh, over and above a, a HIMO that's going to accommodate six to eight people or whatever it might be. And then you're in a position of where's the demonstrable harm and impact in traffic terms. So just trying to point out that we do look at these carefully. We are appreciative of the issues, 
Um, and whilst a policy may come forward, it's going to be difficult to evidence in terms of providing that character, impact and overall context for that policy. Thank you. I, as, as, I think what I'm interpreting is that Councillor Kerr has proposed something and Councillor Potter has seconded it, that uh, we ask the officers to consider um, a, a policy on um, HIMOs which presumably will go to the cabinet member in, in, in the long term. Um, can I have a show of hands on that? Because I think that ought to go in the minutes. Those in favor of that proposal, that is, that is unanimous. So um, that will be minuted uh, that we, we have requested that. Okay, thank you. And it's, it can only be a request, it can't be a promise. Um, Councillor Evans. Thank you, Chair. I can only reiterate again what's already been stated today, uh, this evening. But there's also, uh, there was an instance on Beatty Street, which is directly opposite uh, where the development is, about 18 months, two years ago. The, f the fire engine couldn't get down because of the cars parked. It couldn't even get around the corner. Uh, so the parking is already atrocious around this area. Uh, and surely that, things like that should be taken into consideration as well. Uh, the fire brigade will, will back that up if, if the data is checked, and we ought to be probably considering things like that. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, it, is, it is used as a rat run, and it's not just a mini rat run, it is really severely used. I was down there this morning, not as a rat run, I hasten to say, uh, and it was, it was, you can't really come up Brighton Road in the mornings, you need to go down, and in the evenings you, you can't go down Brighton Road, you need to go up, otherwise you'll be waiting ages. It, it really is uh, quite a dire. Thank you. I do understand that. I do recall when we actually had a, a fire officer um, as a member of this committee, Bob Schofield, Labour councillor, and uh, he, he was asked that question about um, getting a fire engine down to places, and he always said, I've got a very long hose, which, uh, <laughs> which meant it, uh, he could get from one end of the road with, without actually getting the engine down there, that's the point. Okay, um, we have a recommendation then uh, to grant permission with conditions, those in favour? Sure. Yeah. Everybody happy with that um, additional condition on cycling? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. So then, those in favour of the recommendation as printed at the bottom of page 66, as amended by Councillor Cares. Those in favour, that is one, two, two. three, four. four. Those against, one, two, three, four. I haven't voted yet. <laughs> Um, I think for consistency, I'll go with the refusal because um, I think we've got a principle here to, uh, to, to thrash out, haven't we? If that means going to two appeals, um, at least we'll get some guidance one way or the other from a planning inspector. Uh, I think it would be fairly perverse uh, for me to opt um, to have one decision going one way and one the other, so uh, uh, in which case um, I'm voting against the recommendation as, as printed, which uh, means of course that that isn't carried. Would somebody like to propose perhaps uh, a parallel um, to the last um, recommendation? Councillor Rawson, would you like your, your wording to go for both? Okay, thank you. And uh, the, is that seconded? Councillor Froggett, thank you. Yeah. And just, just in terms of, the, the, there are no extensions on this scheme. Yeah, fair the, enough. The previous scheme had an extension. Okay, so with that difference, and, and obviously a different address. Uh, okay. Um, and Councillor Rawson, will you represent the committee at appeal? Sorry, sorry. Copy and paste, we, we, I think. We didn't actually take a vote on the second. We got, got it second, but we didn't actually take a All right. Okay. I put it to you that we, we refuse on the grounds that uh, Councillor Rawson listed earlier, which has been seconded by Councillor Froggart, those in favour of refusal. Okay, one, two, three, four, five. Those against, one, two, three. Okay, so that refusal is carried. Thank you, it's been an interesting evening.
Let us move on then to um, major visits, um, which is on page three, according. Oh, I see. If item seven, appendix two. There are th three of those which are variations of conditions, which I don't think a site visit would make any difference to. So we have um, former canal land south of Nottingham Road, Spondon. Would anybody like to go to look at that? I think it can be seen anyway. It's it's um, proposal. Um, where am I? Yeah, to reinstate the former can canal basin to create a surface water balancing pond and form formation of multi-use paths. I mean, it's not that major, is it? And we have already agreed in principle. Are there any sort of is there anything in the hinterland that we should particularly be aware of, or levels, or well, I'm sure that will be shown to us on the night. Access or anything like that that we should we can't see from an overhead. Can, can, it, can we get public access to it if we want to have a look? Yeah, from the west. Yeah. Okay, so um, if you you click on that reference, you'll you'll get a plan and you can go on your bicycle. Okay. Um, the other one is land off Phoenix Street. Uh, this is a full application for the erection of a new building providing 202 residential apartments. Now, under any estimation, this is going to be controversial. You can see it from the road, of course. Um, I would suggest if you do go and look at it, you look at it also from the other side of the road, the conservation area, Nottingham Road conservation area. Um, do you want an official visit? You propose an official visit. I'd rather we, we went beforehand rather than somebody holds up the application on the night saying, let's go and have a look at it. So we'll arrange, we'll arrange a visit to that so that we can have a good look at it. Anything else we need to add on that? No. Thank you. In which case, meeting closed at 12 minutes past eight.